Listen to Shoot the Defense. It's unbelievable, Jeff. Hello and welcome to Shoot the Defense on, on FNX. I'm your host, Stel, and on this special edition, I'm joined by a gentleman who had the spellbook of wing wizardry a few years before the Ryan Giggs hype train came to the fore. Now, my guest is a Crystal Palace legend, but has played alongside other club legends such as Ian Wright, Mark Bright, our mate Simon Osborne, Alan Pardew, and the current England manager, Gareth Southgate. He's played under some remarkable managers and minds in the game like Steve Koppel, Gordon Strachan, Ron Atkinson, and even Kevin Keegan. I can go on all day about former colleagues and how he helped mould their careers on and off the pitch. I mean, ask Dion Dublin about getting on the end of his, his crosses. Ask Darren Huckabee and Noel Whelan about latching onto through balls. I'm sure the likes of Peter Beardsley and my mate Barry Hales can wax lyrical about this man's knowledge and experience on and off the pitch. It's my pleasure to welcome John Salaka to shoot the defence. Welcome, mate. How you doing? Yeah, brilliant. Thank you. What an intro. Thank you very much. There you go. See, I did my research. And, and uh, I, I went back to my memory banks because as, a, as an 80s baby, I remember you playing, Ori. Yeah, no. Brilliant times, really. They just uh, getting into the Palace side in the um, late 80s, sort of 88, 89. And then obviously 1990, the cup final with Man United. 91, we finished third in the what would be the Premier League in the top flight. Uh, won the Zenith Data Systems final. Uh, and then the England caps followed after that. Um, Unfortunately, then the knee injuries came, um, and but you know cracked on after that and and did the best we can. So some great times at Coventry, you say. Then uh, Fulham with Kevin Keegan, Charlton with Kirby Lee, and those guys Richard Rufus and and the boys. And then obviously went to to Reading um, with Alan Pardew again. Some some great times there. Um, Stevie Hunt and and those guys, Nicky Forster. Um, great times get promotion there um, and then had that one year with Martin Allen at Brentford God, it all seems like a long time ago now <laughs> you could write a book mate and you should write a book to be honest to be that fair. would be interesting I have to say exactly all the stories there but look let's, let's talk about Crystal Palace because th their season so far hasn't been great for the faint hearted supporters are, are you confident Hodgson will keep them up no absolutely I'm in no doubt Palace will stay up it's uh, you know it's just been an incredible journey you know, for Palace, you know, when they got up, I think it's five years ago, won the playoff against Watford, you know, just, you know, Steve Parrish and Martin Long and those guys coming and saved the club at the last hour. Um, and, the, and the fans just embraced the whole journey, you know, I think because they were within sort of one or two hours of, you know, maybe going out of extinction and the club going under, they, you know, they just rejuvenated the fans. They went into the Premier League with a with an unbelievable attitude and, and they've arguably been the best fans. Um, and if you look at Holloway struggle, then, you know, Pulis came in and, and saved the club and, and, and you've got Warnock came in and he's had his struggles. Then Pards came in and, 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 you know, did well, then struggled. And then obviously Sam saved the club last year from relegation and then he left. And obviously now, you know, Frank, the ball came in, struggled the first four games, got the sack and, mm. you know, Palace ended up losing the first seven games and, and, you know, fair play to Roy Hodgson. He could have, you know, been on a beach somewhere, you know, enjoying retirement and taking life easy, but he took on a great challenge and he's done an incredible job with Ray Lewington there and Stephen Reid and the boys, you know, really got the best out of uh, the team and after losing the first seven games, everyone thought Palace are down. But what's happened since then has been quite incredible. Uh, great turnaround and you know as long as Wilfred Zaha stays fit then I think yeah no problems Absolutely. I mean, we're talking on the show on, on Tuesday with Saji Burton about Crystal Palace and how, you know, they've only really had one recognised striker all season with, with Benteke and they're still, you know, fighting for survival. They're getting goals from all over the pitch. Like players like Van Arnhout has been has been contributing. So it's been it's been an up and down season, as I said, but you know what, if anyone can get them out of the mire, it's, it's Roy Hodgson. He's done it before with other clubs, so I don't see why he can't do it for them. Yeah, Roy's a top class manager. You know, he's he's, he's so experienced. You know, been right throughout Europe, managed Switzerland, you know, managed England, obviously. It didn't end well there. Um, and he, he probably felt, he, you know, he obviously had a lot more to offer. Uh, he didn't want to leave uh, football on that note. Um, and he's, he's come in and, and really, I think his man management skills, his, you know, tactical acumen, 
has been you know fantastic to see at Palace and and getting the boat the best out of those players. So you know it's amazing how how much influence that Wilfred Zaha has. But you know the injuries to Sacco, you know these you know to Punchin to Scotty Dan, you know Wardy got injured. So you know it's just been an endless list. Um, you know. Connor Wickham, obviously, he's, he's a massive talent, but can't seem to stay fit. So, as you say, the striking problems at Palace have been well documented and, and really just need Ben Teke to find some sort of form and, and perform as we know he can because he's a top, top class striker. Mm, and Solov has done pretty well since coming. I know he hasn't uh, you know, set the Premier League on fire, but he's a, he's a workhorse, isn't he? He really does, um, does a job for the club. Yeah, it's one of those that I look at him. He's obviously very talented, not blessed with great pace, which ideally is one of the big things you need in the Premier League. But, you know, he's got a great brain on him. And I think it just takes, it's, it's massive to come into the Premier League, new club, move countries. Uh, he'll settle in and he's having a good look at it. And I think with a good pre-season, you know, do some real good work in the gym. Uh, just being around that quality and that standard of players day in, day out will, will improve him, no doubt. And I, I think um, he's one of those players that I think w- will be will be better suited once he settles in and he, he knows the ropes. Um, he, he could be a force in the next couple of seasons. Absolutely. Now, we, you mentioned De Boer earlier and, and obviously your mate Pardew. Now, someone told us that De Boer was actually doomed from the first few training sessions because he was putting other players to shame. Like, for example putting free kicks in the top bin and telling them that's what they should be doing. Now, if you, if you look at Alan Pardew, he lasted four months at West Brom and I think his record is only two wins out of his last 29 games. Now, he's managed five different Premier League clubs and you two go way back, but as an aspiring coach, does it frustrate you when someone with pretty poor record continues to get jobs in the top division? Yeah, it's kind of weird with Pards, isn't it? I mean, he did a fantastic job at uh, Reading, then went to to West Ham and did a great job there. You know, then he went on to Southampton, uh, Charlton, um, and he, he deserved that that big role at Newcastle. And it seems to go really well for Alan um, to start with, and he seems to win a lot of games, plays entertaining, open attacking football, and then he, he you know things just seem to 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 go down and spiral. From there, where he seems to go through long periods without uh, winning many games, um, which is, I, I can't really explain it to be honest, but I think he, he is quite stubborn in the way he manages. He sticks to his ideas, sticks to his guns, um, and he doesn't really change things much. Don't really, I ever experienced him parking the bus and, and being really defensive, uh, but he's a fantastic manager. You know, he, he, he knows the players, he knows the game, tactically, he's very, very astute. Um, you know he's bright, uh, and he, you know he's great around the place. And I can understand why he keeps getting jobs, to be honest. And you know you sort of get to the point now where everyone's sort of saying, well, after the failure at, at West Brom, arguably a failure at, at Palace, will he get another job? And I, I think he will. Uh, but I know he's got ambitions to possibly manage in in America. Could possibly get the lure of China. Uh, but he's he's had an incredible career from where he came from. Wasn't a, a top player by any means, but Worked hard, great engine, good lad to be around uh, in the dressing room. And he sort of learned and, and made the most of, of limited resources, if I say that. But, you know, sometimes great players don't make great coaches or managers. And he sort of used that. Um, and, and whichever way, he's had a tremendous career as a manager. Yeah, and the first manager to dance in the technical area at Wembley, I think, as well. So that's yeah, that, that, that cost us. I don't think he, he can be too proud of that moment. You know, 1-0 up, going to according to plan. We, we needed to really kill the game and maybe someone go down, maybe a keeper or, you know, Jed and Ak go down and just, just kill the momentum and just, just really distract and, and subdue Man United. But, you know, class comes to the top, Wayne Rooney dances through and things run to the far post for one matter to, to, to equalise. Um, really killed us um, and even though they went down to 10 men and, and that was a major disappointment so I felt after losing to Man United in the 1990 Cup final to be back at Wembley against Man United uh, Van Hal going out the door Man United in, in you know sort of you know they, they were all over the place really in the way they were playing no confidence and uh, you know great chance to win and Pards does the little jink on the, on the touchline and oh, the rest is history isn't it so <laughs> Exactly, exactly. 
Well, look, let's talk about your old club, Reading, one of your old clubs. How do you think Paul Clement will do that? I mean, he's another manager whose reputation is damaged a little after his last two jobs were pretty unsuccessful. Yeah, you know, he, he's, um, you know, he's obviously a very, very astute coach. Um, tactically, uh, he's learned the ropes, obviously, uh, over in Germany, and he's come back across, and, you know, Derby and Chelsea, and, you know, so... He's very experienced and very knowledgeable in the game, and you know Reading's a wonderful chance. It's it's very much a blank canvas there. You know Yapstan came in with a lot of fanfare. You know Ajax Academy, and he was going to. But you know, in all truth, you know it's so difficult being a manager, especially the turmoil that Reading have had off the pitch with ownership, uh, with lack of funding. So it's very difficult to bring the right players in and implement your own ideas and. Uh, you know, I go back. I started my coaching with, with you know, with Brian McDermott, mm-hmm. who was academy director, and and obviously Brendan Rogers um, there, who were fantastic footballing brains, uh, great guys. Uh, so that was a good educational curve for me. Uh, and they obviously did so well there. Stevie Coppel did well there before before them. So you know, it's a wonderful club, um, and just hope there's a little bit of stability off it now. There's a little bit of money to spend. And you know, he'll, claim, he'll need he'll need that he'll need to to be able to go out and, and bring in the players he wants because that squad needs needs freshening up and it you know it'd be great if uh, you know Reading can get back in the mix and start competing at the top of that that championship which is obviously you know it's a tough tough league you look at the top there now uh, it's a lot of good clubs vying to get into that magical circle of the Premier League and. Obviously, with the financial rewards now that go along with it, it's it's it, you know every, the competition is is even greater. Yeah, and the, the pressure is uh, even greater as well. And, and speaking of pressure, what do you make of Gareth Southgate's time as England head coach, and, and what do you expect to see from the national team in Russia? I, I was saying to the guys the other day, he's kind of in a, a win-win situation in the sense that you know not much is expected of this England team um, given the past couple of campaigns or past couple of tournaments and it's not a squad that is filled with superstars like a golden era like 2004 for example do you think uh, you know he'll pull up a few trees in, in Russia? Do you know the, the, the Gareth Southgate journey has been just incredible mm-hmm. um, I was very sad to, to see what happened with Sam you know big Sam you know he, he'd waited all his career you know it was a massive ambition of his and it, it's the proudest moment to, to be England manager and and for it to end with him being, you know, you know, say tucked up by, you know, the Telegraph and, and recorded some, some comments that he made, which, you know, weren't massively detrimental, but I think just left the FA in a very, you know, in a very difficult position, especially with Seb Blatter and what happened with FIFA and, and for, for an England manager to be talking about, you know, sort of understanding and knowing about how to get around third party rules was, was very damaging and, they could have slapped him on the wrist and said, look, Sam, you know, don't do that again. You've got to be really careful and, and go down that route. But, you know, they decided to sack him and, and really one door closes, another one opens. And, and Gareth just was very fortunate to be in the right place at the right time. And, you know, he's a safe pair of hands. He's a very intelligent guy. Um, he conducts himself fantastically well. He speaks very openly. He's very experienced. 55 England caps. You know, he's been captain since I think Captain Palace at 22. So, you know, just talk about someone like Ray Wilkins, captain Chelsea at 18. You know, Gareth. So Gareth always had that maturity. Has always had that understanding, and he's he's always been a student of the game. Gareth, you know, he's always taking every bit. You know, sports science. You know, the psychology side uh, of the game. And, you know, he's one of those players that just made the the very, very best of, of limited ability and shows how far you can go. And what he's done, I think he, he's man management and his understanding and his humility um, and just giving the players a platform to play from. And, you know, we started it, you know, against Germany and Brazil. I thought those were excellent performances, bringing in people like Loftus-Cheek. Um, and, and now, you know, going forward... Um, the game, I thought the game against Holland was arguably the best I've seen England play for a very, very long time. And players playing with a, with a confidence, with an exuberance, with an energy um, that uh, I really enjoyed. Uh, and they, they took that into the, the Italy game. It wasn't. It was more of a Wembley performance against Italy, where fair play to Italy, they're, it's a, they're a top class side. So but I thought there was a lot of pluses, you know, especially without Kane. And, and what we want is competition for places, and that's what we seem to have now. And 
and certainly we haven't got any real superstars um you, you know but what we have got is we've got players um like Oslay Chamberlain like you know Lingard um you know Vardy they've got to take their chances Sterling's playing well and you can see you know Trippier right back Walker's gone into that that right hand side of a, of a back three and we seem comfortable there Rose battling out with Ashley Young um you know, a left back. So it, it's 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 great to see, and we don't need superstars. And I think we can easily reach sort of quarterfinals, semi-finals um, with the with the squad we've got. And if the players really embrace it and 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 go into this tournament with a desire and an application that that maybe in in previous tournaments we haven't had. Absolutely, and a couple of quick things before I let you go, John. You were use the words desire, you know, um, application. Ray Walkins was uh, the epitome of those words, wasn't he? Uh, unfortunately, he's, he, he passed away yesterday. Um, what can you tell us about Ray Walkins? What do you remember about him? Uh, well, Ray came to Palace, I think he was 36, 37, right you know, towards the end of his career. He was lucky enough to play, I think, till he was 38, 39, maybe even 40. So, you know, but, you know, when Ray walked in that dressing room, he, he's a superstar. He's an absolute legend, you know. Chelsea, Man United, PSG, AC Milan, Rangers, you know, he, he, you know, when he walked in, he's one of those, we were youngsters, you know, myself, Gareth Southgate, you know, people like Chris Cullen, Richard Shaw, Dean Gordon, Chris Armstrong, you know, and, and you just, you just had a, he added a presence and a, a and a belief in us and, and just the way he conducted himself, his integrity, his desire to win, um, his professionalism, was just was, was very infectious and you know he was just such a great guy twinkly in his eye liked a bit of banter you know go out have a beer with us he'd always you know be first on the training ground he was always immaculate uh in the way he he presented himself on and off the park and and he, he was just an absolute gentleman um and an absolute joy to, to be around um and and to be fair footballing wise he taught us so much he, he, you know his legs weren't he didn't wasn't blessed with great pace anyway but what he had was an incredible footballing brain two great feet you know he could sit in front of that back four and pick out passes be that link up man and, and get us to play and, and and open us up so you know from a tactical and uh, and professional point of view he was incredible but as a guy you know just absolutely amazing so it was an absolute delight and it's one of those moments that you know when i heard the news first of all that he'd had a heart attack you know it was just you, you just prayed for him and wish but to hear he passed away was devastating and you know it's a it's a loss of a very great man and an absolute legend uh of football absolutely you know there have been tributes all over the world you know we saw franco Baresi last night in the milanese the derby milanese and you know Players like uh, Ray Walkins and personalities like Ray Walkins are few and far between, um, you know. And, and these days, he'd be worth 100, 120 million pounds as a footballer, wouldn't he? I mean, that's not just, not just saying that because he passed, but as you said, his range of passing. You know, players like him are few and far between. So, you know, we, we wish his family well, and you know, obviously, obviously offer our condolences. Now, a, a, another sensitive subject. Um, Sol Campbell, he, he was very vocal with his feelings about black coaches in the UK and how he believes they aren't being given a chance. Now, I read an article about how you've struggled to find a coaching role in the UK. I, I mean, I can think of a handful of black coaches who've been given a chance, notably uh, Chris Hewton, uh, Keith Curl, Hasselbank, even Paul Lintz and Chris Powell. Now, I know the likes of Troy Townsend, um, Marcus Gale, Paul Mortimer and Ossi Sankofa are really working their socks off at Kick It Out to make a difference and educate people. Now, as someone who's played at the highest level and, and lived in a period where racism at many grounds was rife, do you think Sol Campbell has a point? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think Sol doesn't always come across, um, you know, maybe as, as he intends to. And he, he can come across as a little bit arrogant, um, a little bit pushy and demanding um, that, you know, certain things should change and certain things should happen. But I think the message and actually what he's saying is actually spot on. I think it's incredible, really, from, from when I started playing, you know, the, the numbers of, of black players as has just gone through the roof and, and the level and, and the standard of, of, of those players um, that have come through are quite incredible. I think there probably are a number of aspects. I mean, by far, you know, there's an old guard, there's an old school and an old way of thinking in this country still. I think the guys who own clubs, I think the, the guys who are chairman, chief execs, uh, who are on boards, 
um, you know, still, without them probably realising, I think there is a bit of uh, institutionalised racism and, and, you know, they perhaps want to go for, you know, the guys that they they respect and, and their idols, you know, your Brian Robsons, you know, your, your Stevie Bruce's, you know, your Man United Liverpool players will always will be right up there. They seem to get jobs. But there is definitely a disparity in how many black players play the game and how many black players are coaching and managing the game. So it, it's changing. As you said, I think, you know, organisations like Kick It Out, I've seen it move on leaps and bounds, and I think that will continue to happen. Um, you know, the Rooney rule is, is arguably, I think that's, that's done wonders for the NFL. And, uh, you know, I think the same could happen here. And it's not a case of saying you know, black players or black coaches should be given roles. It's just given an opportunity to present themselves um, and, and to be able to state their case and, and, and pitch themselves forward for a job. And I think one of those things, it, it, a lot of racism is born out of ignorance. I don't think there is that deep down rooted racism that it, you find in, in probably Eastern Europe, um, that you find in America, um, you find in, in, you know, perhaps in places like Spain and Italy and, and um you know, Portugal, but that is a lot of times because they just don't have contact and don't have, you know, black friends, black colleagues, you know, and, and I think once people are, 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 you know, more more used to having friends, and, it, and that goes throughout whether, you know, the, the, you know, the homophobic scenario, you know, everyone sort of has a friend or an accountant or a lawyer or a colleague that maybe gay, you know, black, and, and I think it's just become a, a, a part of society that everyone's accepting now. So, you know, there still needs to be a push. There needs to be so much more done. And really what we need is these iconic role models to come through now um, to encourage young black players to, to do their coaching badges, to take an interest in the games, to be student of the games, to understand, you know, to take um, qualifications, to be chief execs, to be directors of football, um, you know, to, to take up roles within football that, that, again, you know, maybe, you know, we need a few black owners of, of football clubs um, and it'd be interesting to see how that works. So the landscape is changing uh, in that respect and, you know, to a certain extent, you know, I'm not, not happy, but I'm very encouraged um, that, you know, there's people like Chrissy Powell out there, Chrissy Hute and, you know, Les Ferdinand, uh, he's working in the game and, and people like Keith Cole. So we just need more people to, you know, there's a lot of top, top class players who, one, just expect to get a job. And once they, you know, if they do fail, they don't really chase it. Maybe like your Johnny Barnes had the experience at Celtic, you know, Paul Lintz, you know, didn't really push it. But a lot of top players just expect to walk into jobs. And that isn't going to happen. I think they've got to push those doors and make those doors open. Uh, and that that will that will continue to happen, and I'm I'm sure that you know I think in in five ten years time it it will be um, more more of a mix, and that we will have top top black managers you know in the game. Mm, absolutely, absolutely. And on a final note, mate, um, Lloyd Lloyd Uwusu, Brentford legend and, and a friend of the show, had to get that in as his own academy in Australia. And, and, and <laughs> Love Lloyd, yeah, I had a little. Hi. Top bloke. I played with Lloyd at, uh, at, uh, at, um, at Reading, and a great lad. Top bloke. Uh, he's, uh, I think his nephew plays for the, the Australian national team. Uh, Alex goes back. Oh, uh, okay. yeah, I spoke to yeah. Him, yeah, I spoke to him last night, and I had to get that one in as well. See, and um, and Leon Constantine, he, he's doing remarkably well out here with his academy. W would you do something similar in nations where where football is evolving, like, like Australia and, and the States? I mean, you said that Pardew is looking for possibly a job in MLS. Now MLS is doing really well at the moment, and we've seen Ibrahimovic with yeah. waves. Um, would you go out there and, and, and coach? Um, I think it's. I, mean, I, I think from my point of view, it's very difficult. I think for when I came out of the game at thirty six, I did you know try and apply for a number of jobs, and you know as years gone by, um, you know I I've got a nine year old daughter, so you know things like that always have a very big impact to whether or not you can uproot your family um, and, and go and live in. As much as I'd love to go and live in America or work in Europe. Um, working in another country, I think there's a lot of considerations in around your your home life, your personal life that you know people don't don't really realise the massive impact it has uh, and the decisions that you have to take. And really, and that that's another thing that you come to that um, you know management and coaching is, is 24/7, and it you know it's 
and and the biggest sacrifice is your family, um, <laughs> perhaps your health as well. So, um, you know, sometimes chasing that dream is is a bit of a young man's game, and you get on that ladder, and that takes you into places. You know, myself, you know, working for Sky and 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 sort of having a couple of you know businesses outside of football, you have commitments um, that aren't easy to give up because. And the, and the worst thing, you know, the problem with football is it's so transient, it's so ruthless, and it's so cutthroat. Um, you know, just as I thought, you know, I'd finally had made my breakthrough, got the first team coaching role at, at Crystal Palace, uh, my club, you know, and I felt, you know, at home there. And I thought if I could cut my teeth for, you know, sort of two, three years there, um, you know, then the world's your oyster to maybe look at getting a job and, you know, wherever that may lie, and you'd have the confidence to go and do it, but, you know, having sort of been ruthlessly dumped, um, really, you know, that, that did have a massive impact, and I was, I was quite, you know, sort of broken-hearted about that and, and disappointed in, in the game, but that's just the way it works, and, you know, that's what you've got to be prepared to deal with, because as much as you talk about managers on the merry-go-round, you know, they put themselves on the line, they sacrifice, um, and the impact of, of getting sacked and having to up and leave and, you know, even Jose Mourinho living in a hotel in Manchester, mm. you know, it's hard and it, 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 it wears you down and you've got to have a certain thick skin, a uh, certain belief and a certain lifestyle uh, where it's got to be accepted. And and as I say, I think the the biggest impact is on, on family because you've got to sacrifice them. They don't see you. You're away for long periods. You're on the phone to agents, you know, to players, to, to board members, you know, the press hound you, you know, but, you know, one... If you if, if that's what you, you desperately desire, then then you would. And f- for me right now, um, I can't really see myself, you know, getting up and, and uprooting and going anywhere really because there's no guarantees. You know, um, I just want to make, you know, build my businesses. You know, maybe you know, go back into the media and, and do coaching at a, maybe a lower level. That's, well, John, I tell you what, mate. You know, and I'm not just saying this because you know you're my guest, but. Someone with your experience, your knowledge, you've, you've played, as I said, the highest level, you've played against world champions, I mean, you, you, you know, you played against Germany for crying out loud, and they were the world champions, you, you stepped in when John Barnes was injured, and had it not been for a knee injury, you know, you'd have, you'd have made that Euro 92 squad, in my, in my opinion, but, look, it's been an absolute pleasure having you on the show, I, th- I think it would be great to see you back in the media, it would be great to have you back on the show. Listen, I, I love football, football's in my heart, and, and funny enough, you know, if the right thing came along, I'm sure I just... I just wouldn't be able to resist it. So, you know, I'm always putting myself out there. I, I, I love doing the media stuff and I love doing all the bits I do and, and, and I'm always sort of coaching here and there. So, you know, always, you know, I'm ready, I think. Uh, so you never know. Watch this face. I mean, I'm sort of getting to that age of 50 now where I'm, I'm getting a bit sensible. But <laughs> listen, you've got to dare to dream and keep believing that, that um, things can happen. So you just never know. So watch this space. Fantastic. That's absolutely brilliant. Well, guys, that was John Salako. He's on Twitter, at John Salako. Get in touch because I tell you what, he's very uh, very vocal on Twitter. Um, we're also on Twitter, at Shoot Defence. Until next time, take care.